Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 123 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at what people do when they get their first electric vehicle, the initial few weeks of ownership, what sort of issues you get. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. Before we start, I wanted to say that if you're new to the channel, welcome. Might I suggest you have a quick look at our basics episode, search for basics on our website, and that'll give you the key things you need to know about electric cars and living with them. There are also some links in the show notes. And this leads us nicely onto our main topic of discussion today, which is your first day with an electric vehicle. If you're a listener to the podcast, there's a good chance you already have an EV. But I know from conversations that there are people who listen who are in the stage of considering whether to get an electric vehicle but haven't made the leap yet. Or, likewise, they put down an order and, like many people nowadays, have a weight on their hands while their EV comes through the manufacturing bottlenecks and gets to them. I count myself amongst that crowd as... Since announcing what car I'm getting to replace my Kia Soul, it's gone into a backlog and I'm now not scheduled to get my ID3 until the end of October this year, 2022. Or, alternatively, like new patron subscriber Ron Godfrey, you've taken the plunge and finally your newly ordered EV is on your doorstep. Last week we discussed EVs 101 and looked at some of the basic differences between driving and owning an electric vehicle and driving and owning an internal combustion engine car. Now that we're all up to speed with those, I wanted to move on and talk about that first day with an EV. So I wanted to talk today with people who've recently got an EV, or people who we know uh, have some interesting stories about the day they got their EV. And, you know, they've been through that difficult process of transitioning from an internal combustion engine car to an electric vehicle. What issues did they have? What did they like? And what would they do differently? So I'll be talking today to a number of EV owners. All of them have been on the podcast before, but covering different topics. We'll be hearing uh, initially from returning guest Michael French, who recently took delivery of a Hyundai Ionic after driving a Prius for many years. I'll also be chatting again with Matthew Thompson, who was on last season chatting about his Polestar 2. We'll be hearing from Kate Tyrrell, who came on to talk about Safe Charge at the end of last season, about her day with the her first day with an electric vehicle. And uh, we'll be hearing for the first time from Simon Brace, who runs the Lakes Electric Van Delivery Service. Um, He'll tell you about his first day with an electric van. We're chatting electric vans in more detail with Simon in an episode to be released in the next few weeks. Finally, Quentin Wilson will be back because he has a fantastic story about the first time he ever got into an EV and drove it. As a reminder, we did a series of episodes called The Beginners series, which are episodes 36, 37, 38 and 39, covering topics such as cables, charging and range anxiety. Last week's episode was also called the EV 101 episode and it covered some of the basics about buying and running an EV. They're linked in the show notes. But let's have a quick think about what you're going to be doing when you do get your first few days with an EV. Obviously, the first thing you're going to do is sit in it, maybe drive it, admire the acceleration, the silence, the relaxing feeling of driving it. And then you might do one of two things. Either you'll attach a charging cable at home, a three pin granite cable or a normal Menekes connector, the type two, and attach it to a power source. And then you'll start to check if it has things like charging schedules that can be set up. Your car will usually have one unless it's one of the new MGs, as well as setting up the preheating if you have a regular commute so that when you're getting in the morning, the car's all nicely defrosted and warm or cool, depending on whether it's summer or not. If your vehicle has an associated app, you'll likely have a play with that and see what you can and can't do. All these are fairly mundane and straightforward things that you can do without ever leaving your driveway or wherever you park your car overnight. At some point, however, you'll want to go and try a bit of public charging. There are numerous videos of people heading out to their local rapid charger to see how easy it is to charge up. Unfortunately, a large majority of them are relatively unsuccessful. The main reason for this is that they haven't downloaded the appropriate app or ordered the right RFID card. Now that's becoming less and less of an issue as more units are going to contactless. But people are still getting caught out with units that don't work or units that are incompatible with their car. Presumably everyone is aware of fully charged presenter and uh, children's TV presenter Maddie Moat and her first effort at rapid charging in an e-Nero. 
she went to a standard three-headed charger plugged into the AC connector because that was the one that fit the connector in her car and she left it for an hour. And when she came back, she'd only put about six miles on the battery. Now, I personally have arrived at an Osprey charger to find a, an Audi e-tron plugged in on the AC connector pulling around seven kilowatts. And when I asked the owner why she wasn't using the CCS connector, she was unaware that her car actually had a CCS connector. I pulled down the little flap at the bottom of the connector to reveal the extra CCS pins and it, it was like she'd actually seen Santa Claus delivering her presents. It's an education issue and we've talked about this on earlier episodes. But let's assume you do manage to find a working charger, connect the correct cable, get the charger going and charge the car. What then? Well, we could go on and on, but at the end of the day, it's probably easier to speak to someone who's recently been through this. You may remember back in an earlier episode, I spoke with Michael French. Michael's recently taken delivery of a 38 kilowatt hour Hyundai Ionic, and I spoke to him about the process of finding, test driving and ordering that car. But while I was speaking with him, I also talked about his experience with the car as a first time EV driver. And this is what he told me about his first day. It's all about the charging. I tell you what, though, the first thing I did, I literally got the car. Um, the guy had driven it down from Shrewsbury and he delivered it at, I think it was about quarter to seven in the morning. It was ridiculously early. It was still pitch black outside. And he delivered the car and was like, oh, I've just, I had to fast charge it on the way. But, you know, here's the car, blah, blah, blah. And off he went. He just walked down the road. He's like, I've got to go to Potter's Bar. Strolled down the street. I was like, I don't know how he was getting anywhere. Just walking down where I live is so bizarre. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of had breakfast. I jumped in the car and I went to the Watford um, uh, Tesco, kind of like the big one they have there. And they have some free plugs. So I literally got to Tesco, plugged it in, um, left it a couple of hours, wandered around, you know, did the usual kind of stuff. Went down the high street. I had, had some errands to run anyway. But at least I, I was then confident. I was like, okay, that's my first charging experience. I've plugged it in. I can wander around. I can do things. I can come back. My car's still there. It's all in order. But I tell you what, being a first-time EV owner and doing your first few charges is a bit nerve-wracking because of all of the different varieties of um, charging stations there are out there and just using, you know, EV or contactless card or now I've got, I don't know if other brands do it as well, but with Hyundai, you can sign up to get like a generic card. So I got one of those and now I'm loving it. It works on all of them. So I'm just rocking up to any charge station, slapping that on, getting my charge done, off I go, which is brilliant. A couple of weeks ago, we spoke with Matthew Thompson. I asked him what was the first thing he did when he got his new EV, a Polestar 2. The very first thing that I did was to put it on charge, just to make sure that, one, I was able to charge it, and two, that it had enough enough um, enough charge to get me to where I wanted to go the next day. I, I got the car while I was in the middle of relocating and moving stuff between a storage unit and the place I'd just relocated to. So I, the very next thing that I did was to take it to a storage unit, fold all the seats down and fill it full of boxes. <laughs> I'd, it's a great test of a car. If you, if you can put a ton of stuff in the car and still have fun driving it, you know you've got a good one. What about home charging? Does Matthew have a charger? I still don't have home charging. I've been running off a granny charger for about 15 months now. So it, it literally was, I had a an outside plug socket that I knew I could get to and I plugged it into that. So when did he do his first rapid charge for a long distance journey? It was probably a couple of weeks. It was one of the trips where I needed it rather than a, a trip where I just, just did it. I wasn't 100% sure at first about reliability, availability, that kind of thing. It worked out really well. It was a, a BP unit that was not far from the not far from the storage unit that I was renting. You know, just one of the 50 kilowatt ones at that point. I think the the real the real first journey that that was going on holiday to Scotland. So that was about 9 months. Everything else had been journeys that, in theory, the vehicle could have done, but I chickened out on. The first journey where I actually really needed it was a journey up to Scotland, stopping off in the Lake District. I used uh, one of MFG's new hubs in Berry. They're great. I love the fact that they have some some cover, and they're they're also the only charger that I've seen that 
actually explain on a sticker that you are not going to get 150 kilowatts out of them unless you've got an 800 volt car. So above the charge handle, there's a little sticker that tells you what power you will get at what voltage. Traditionally, your human male is not predisposed to read the manual when it comes to something new. However, I recently chatted with Simon Brace for an upcoming episode on electric vans. Simon has driven various EVs over the year, uh, but the first one he got was a Renault Zoe for his wife. But when he got his first van, guess what he did? Uh, the first thing I did when I got an electric van, oh, do I admit it? Yeah, I think I think I probably sat down and read the manual. That's Yeah, no, I probably drove home. I got it from Manchester. So yeah, I think I'd 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 been in the Zoe years for for some months by then. So the the actual driving experience wasn't a new thing. So I think I'd drive it home from Manchester, probably had to rapid charge once, maybe twice, and just thought, wow, what can this thing do? How do I use it? Uh, uh, and then probably read the manual in the evening. That's so sad, isn't it? But there you go. I'm 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 man enough to admit these things. Um, yeah, yeah, and then I mean, all I did, all I did then was was bore my customers because um, you know I'd got rid of a diesel and got electric, and and back then electric vans people didn't even know they existed, and and to be honest, people still are amazed that I turn up in an electric van now. They, you know, because if they have no interest in vans and only cars, they they don't know these things even exist. So um, yeah, it's still it's still a it's still a thing. You know, I don't I haven't got bored of driving an electric van yet, and I hope I don't. We had a great conversation with Kate Tyrrell from Safe Charge towards the end of last season. So while she was here, I asked her what was the uh, first thing she did when she got her electric vehicle. Now, this story ticks all the boxes. Was it a memorable day? I asked. What a day. The 12th of September 2020 <laughs> is the day I went green. Um, and you know what? I was so nervous because I'd never driven an automatic before for starters. Um, I knew that electric vehicles were, were going to be, it was going to be a speedy thing. I was really scared that I was going to put my foot down and, and go mad. Um, and even more so because I was picking up a company car. So I just, I didn't know what to expect. So the morning went like this. I woke up in Reading, which is where I was living at the time. And I caught a train from Reading to London King's Cross and then a, another two trains where I had to I had to get a connection somewhere in the middle up to Grimsby to meet the CEO of my energy, uh, Lee Sutton, who <laughs> had come to hand over the car. And he was sat in the passenger seat. And he, he looked a little bit nervous and he said, oh, you know, I hear that you've not driven electric before. And I said, yes, that's absolutely rightly. <laughs> And I drove him uh, a short way up the road back to the My Energy office, I, I think, um, so that he could see that I could at least handle the car. You know, I was old enough to be insured on it, competent driver, um, had not had any um, reasons to, to be concerned about give me the company car, for example. So drop Lee off and I thought, OK, that, that wasn't too bad. I had kept it under 30, uh, which was the the speed limit on the way back to the office. It was great. Um, and then I had the pleasure of driving back to Reading with the car. And I remember it was left on 69% battery. And I thought, wow, I really wish this had been 100% battery because I'm now going to feel that anxiety range pinch that I've been telling everybody doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> so at this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Bobby Llewellyn uh, fangirl love fully charged live show um I listen to it all the time when I I drive long long range which is quite often so I was telling myself you know there's no such thing as range anxiety your bladder only lasts a couple of hours at a time anyway don't worry about it there's plenty of charging uh, facilities available it's not a problem now <laughs> this was a time before uh, Gridserve announced that they bought the electric highway so the electric highway was still under the uh, under the umbrella of ecotricity and was leaving a lot to be desired in terms of the open M of their network. So I got as far as Watford Gap and I'd never been to a public charge station before. I stopped at Watford Gap. It was a, a seven kilowatt charger and I paid the... £15 pre-off fee 
that it needed and it limited me to 45 minutes of charge at seven kilowatts and I cried. I was like, how on earth am I going to do this? Have I made a huge mistake? This can't be real. I can't believe that it's this bad, but I'm an ambassador now and I have to just grin and bear it. I can't tell people that I'm having a horrendous experience. So I got a little bit of charge there and I think I called my friend and I was in tears and I was like, I don't know what to do. So I went to meet her in Milton Keynes and I went to an Ikea and I tried to plug it in there. And that was also ecotricity. And I was just like, oh my God, I, I can't keep on affording to pay these huge fees for something that's actually costing me £1.50 um, because I'd only just started a new job and I'd been on furlough for six months prior to that. So, you know, money wasn't flush <laughs> and, and I'm freaking out and I know I've got a, a long journey ahead of me and uh yeah I I didn't get much of a charge there again I was limited to 45 minutes and then I found another charger which was on an industrial state and nobody was around and it was daylight when I started charging and I think that was the first time that I thought wow public charge infrastructure is unsafe so really um the my energy role and and getting the company car has led me into now doing charge safe so everything happens for a reason but that first day was tainted with really poor public charge experience but it was made all the better for the acceleration and i loved the acceleration i loved the feel of the car how techy and new and shiny it felt um it was like I was gliding and then I learned very quickly that I wasn't driving a manual anymore when I tried to put my left foot down to change gear <laughs> and broke very heavily <laughs> oh my goodness I have never done that since I always drive with my left foot you know there's always like that little ledge <laughs> safety ledge for your left foot like please put your foot as far over onto the left as you can possibly manage and only drive with your right foot never never use your left foot in an EV oh my goodness I almost shot through that windscreen um but I, I you know what here we are 16 months later I love that car I love it so much I did get to test drive a Tesla once and and now I I, I, I can't stop thinking about it but I do I do love the Gona I can't cheat on her I love that story, but one of the things that I found with electric vehicles is just about everyone has some sort of an interesting story related to something that happened to them, either while they were charging or driving. Quentin Wilson, who was on episode 121 at the start of this season, is no different. Well, I picked up this IMEV um, from, from Birmingham uh, with, with Robert Llewellyn, and I got into it and, and got onto the M6 heading back to Stratford-on-Avon. And just nailed it. And I thought, my goodness, this is fun. This is really, really, really fast. And and so I'm I'm going down the M6 at well, we we, we won't say, but but you know, surging forward in this manic little little bubble. And they were an odd looking thing. Um, and then when I got to close to my destination, Stratford upon Avon, the warning light came on. You know, the turtle <laughs> to say that I only had about like four or five miles left. So I thought, oh, blimey, <laughs> this isn't what I expected. So I, um, I, I, I kind of stopped outside this terraced house, not knowing what I was going to do. And I rang my wife, who was at a party, so she didn't ask the phone and thought, blimey. Um, so I knocked on the door of this terraced house and said, hello, I'm awfully sorry to bother you. I am an electric car driver and I need to plug my car in. And this, this little old lady who was absolutely sweet said, Oh, yes, dear, I've heard about these. Yes, look, there's a plug here. Let me just open the window. So she opens this sash window, and I get the, the, the lead out with a three-pin plug on it, and we push it in. And then she makes me a cup of tea and brings out the biscuits. And I think it, it took, like, you know, almost two hours of, 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 of quite a difficult conversation talking about, you know, her family and, and, and the world at large. And I, I got enough charge to get, to get home. Um, but it was a kind of a surreal moment that, that I look back on and thought, do you know, that was lovely because in those days you felt like a, a pioneer, you know, I am an electric car driver, move out the way. Um, and her reaction was so lovely, um, that it was, you know, instead of being a, a complete crisis where you had to get the tow truck, I managed to cope. And I think that's a, 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 a defining thing that if you, if you do take electric cars seriously, that there, there are, 
you know, constraints. And it's not as easy as it will be. And I always say to people, the charging network will always be better tomorrow than it is today. But you can overcome these things and, and it just requires a bit of planning. So that was me and, and the IMEF stayed around for, for quite a while. And, you know, it was a, a formative moment for me, but it didn't put me off electric cars at all. Quite the opposite. I love that story. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who participated. There were some absolutely fantastic stories in there. It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. This is specifically a UK thing, but I wanted to highlight it in case there were any other similar products around elsewhere in the uh, in the world. The National Savings and Investment, which is the organisation that manages uh, premium bonds um, and government savings, has released a new investment product. It's a green savings bond. You can invest between £100 and £100,000 for a fixed three-year term. Once you invest, you won't be able to access your money until it reaches the end of its term, but in return you'll be guaranteed a fixed rate of interest for three years. The investments go only into green organisations and projects such as improving green public transport, funding renewable energy products such as wind and solar farms, recycling projects to eliminate or reduce waste, and projects such as flood defences and early warning systems. The interest rate at the moment is 0.65% growth, which is not fantastic. The last national savings investment bond I bought was 2.5%, but it is a lot better than other products you can get at national savings and investment, which are at about 0.1%. I'm not a financial advisor. This is not investment advice. But if you want to check it out, the link's in the show notes. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by ZapMap. ZapMap is the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK. Use it to search for available chargers, plan electric journeys, pay for charging on participating networks, and share updates with other EV drivers. ZapMap is free to download and use, with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using ZapMap in-car, on CarPlay, or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at musingsev. If you want a quick reference ebook to read on your Kindle, I wrote a little something called So, You've Got Electric. It's available on Amazon Worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. Please check it out. If you want to support the podcast and the newsletter, please consider contributing to become an EV Musings patron. The link's in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? Well, if you enjoyed this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that ko-fi.com slash evmusings. It takes Apple Pay too. Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, why not subscribe? It's available on iTunes or wherever you catch your podcast. Uh, if you've got a few seconds, why not leave a review? Preferably five stars, as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at Musings EV with the words We were all noobs once. Hashtag if you know you know. Nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder Simon. You know he's very happy to sit and talk chess and chess strategy with you if you want. But he does expect a level of expertise when you want to discuss things like the Sicilian Gambit as an opening move. Otherwise it can be a little frustrating trying to explain it. And I think it, it took like, you know, almost two hours of, 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 of quite difficult conversation. Many thanks for listening. Bye-bye.